All right, welcome everybody. This is the uh, fourth program in this series dealing with uh, information and misinformation. We are very fortunate to have two uh, really great researchers and experts in this area who will be uh, discussing the, uh, <clears throat> the way in which misinformation can affect uh, people, who, uh, so many people who uh, go online. So let me introduce, first of all, Emily Brown is the uh, coordinator of library research and instruction at Bristol Community College. She is interested in how information can be manipulated and distorted and how people use this information to spur unrest. She has worked with Susan, Susan Mort over the last few years to incorporate information literacy into the classroom as a weapon against these unethical uses of information. Susan, Susan Mort is a research instruction librarian with an avid interest in mis disinformation and how people self-radicalize via echo chambers using the social media. <clears throat> this is a very important, as I think everyone knows, too many people are getting sucked in to misinformation. I think what we'll hear now will help us sort this out. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Welcome to our presentation on misinformation. Um, this is just scratching the surface as Emily and I prepared this presentation because even though we've done these presentations prior, as you know, things change rapidly. Um, so as we went down many, many rabbit holes, um, we're going to present just kind of the, the basics to you here. But feel free to afterwards, we will have time for questions and feel free to answer questions. You can put them right in the chat. We have someone monitoring that and we'd be happy to actually answer that for you. Yeah. So we just want to take a second and say before we begin, while this is not necessarily a political conversation, many pieces of propaganda and misinformation originate in our political beliefs or because of our political beliefs. So what we are doing is we are just trying to kind of like cast a wide net and understanding of how these things, misinformation and propaganda, can really work in the real world. So we wanted to start with this idea of extremism on the left. One of the things that we often see in our national discourse is the idea of there's extremism on both sides. So what we wanted to do is kind of start with a conversation about left-wing um, radicalization or extremism. So there have been a number of left-wing um, radical groups that have you know, uh, come up in the last few years. There are sovereign citizen groups as well as prepper communities. Um, for example, the Moorish Science Temple. There has been a rise in left-wing private paramilitary groups since the year 2020. Um, what happens is that as militia groups and gun clubs rise on the right, you see the same thing happening then on the left. Um, it's kind of like a reaction situation. So as paramilitary groups rise, on one side, they tend to arise on the left as well, on the right and then on the left. And then we have Antifa. So one of the things that we have to kind of talk about is Antifa, Antifa is a decentralized and leaderless movement, and essentially they're here to oppose vigorously anti-fascism or fa fascism in general. After the Unite the Right rally, we started to see a rise in the awareness of and participation in um, the movement of Antifa. Essentially, like I said before, they show up to counter protest white supremacist events. While many times Antifa is peaceful, there are a militant wing within the group. Antifa originated in Nazi Germany because what they felt was that if the people had more vigorously and militantly opposed the Nazi party, the party would have never come to power and do what they eventually ended up doing. Um, their ideology can be in line with anarchism, socialism, and even communism. So we wanted to kind of talk about this quote, or we, I just wanted to share this quote with you. It appears that the contemporary movement, Antifa, may be growing as groups recruit followers on fears that fascism is making new inroads in the United States. Such expansion in the rising number of run-ins between Antifa supporters and their opponents at public rallies raised the public public profile of anti-fascism in the United States. So 
Brett and Tarrant, who we'll talk about a little bit more into um, the, the presentation, he, his manifesto, which we'll also talk more about manifestos, the Great Replacement, he actually answers, he asks this question, he answers it, says, from where did you research your beliefs? And the internet, of course. And that's what the focus of this presentation is, is how social media self-radicalizes people on the internet to actually lead them to violence. So I want to take a second to explain, we're going to be used two terms interchangeably, right? So we have misinformation. So misinformation is basically inaccurate information, um, but it's not intended to really deceive you. It's just somebody got their facts right, um, didn't get their facts right. Versus disinformation, which is when we're deliberately misleading you. Okay. So again, false information, which is intended to mislead, especially propaganda. Is that Amelia? Mm -hmm. oh. So for example, um, we see back in 1941, we have Graves who organized centrally directed far-reaching um, symbols to influence public opinion. And then Taylor in 1995 persuade people to believe a desired way using means that involved disinformation and outright deception. So there's many different ways with propaganda, right? So I teach history and we actually talk about this, especially with the use of World War I and World War II, right? So we have rhetoric, the uses of myth and symbolism. So for example, during World War II, the United States used a lot of propaganda using Bugs Bunny cartoons, right? So it seemed innocuous and it was geared at children, but actually it was propaganda um, giving stereotypical identities to Asians and other people of our, that we were fighting against. And we still see propaganda happening like this today. And basically what we want you to remember is that when propaganda doesn't fit in with messages that we already agree with, it's easy for us to reject it and identify it as propaganda. But if the propaganda fits in with our worldview, we often accept it without question. Right. Um, so a lot of this has to do with um, information that's specifically geared to make you feel a certain way. And what's interesting, one of the things as I'm on social media myself and a librarian, I always feel like I'm putting out fires. The recent one is with the rising gas prices where people are blaming the president. And no matter how many times I show relevant information with valid sources that it's really a supply and demand problem, has nothing to do with the president, people don't want to believe that because that's within their, real, their scope of reality. Right. So again, it creates this fictional reality. So it must draw the listener into and beyond the speech, a piece of writing causing internal conflict and reinforcing prejudice. It must highlight that change is possible through the action of the reader or listener. It must convey the, infection, the impression of being objective truth. And it must use overt visual, rhetorical, and symbolic tools that the society as a whole will understand. Yes. And you know, this works for a lot of reasons because we have a, a, an innate need to belong, right? Humans are group animals. We want inclusion in a community. We um, trust that community because we belong to it and they share our ideas. We consume and share information that often coincides with what that community already believes. And we see that. So what we have tend to see is what we use the term as an echo chamber. So what happens is if you find your tribe on the internet mm -hmm. that's espousing the same beliefs you have, you're just getting that one side of the coin. You're not getting two sides of information. Um, so basically what happens is just reinforcing your belief systems and what happens is leads to self-radicalization. So, and as Susan just said, this works because of in part tribalism, right. right? In part of our own personal biases, and these can be, there's a couple of different like strategies here, right? So there's the different reasonings, or logical reasonings that we do are things like confirmation bias, right? We go out there and we seek out information that supports what we already believe. We selectively expose ourselves to information that reaffirms what we already believe, and oftentimes we apply higher scrutiny to stuff that doesn't quite fit into our biases as it already believes in. Um, and oftentimes what we think is that our own perception of reality is the only perception of reality that is accurate. And this leads to a lot of this like division. And you know, we're gonna talk about self-radicalization. So we're gonna talk about kind of like the far end and the violent matters of this. But you know, this is something that happens in our everyday lives. So 
we're going to move now into self-radicalization. So self-radicalization is the phenomenon when individuals radicalize by consuming extremist literature but have few, at first, formal ties to any specific terrorist organization. So we're going to start with QAnon. I have a little quote, so forgive me for reading. You know that a small group of manipulators operating in the shadows pull the planet's strings. You know that they are powerful enough to abuse children without fear of retribution. You know that mains the mainstream media are the handmaidens in the partnership with Hillary Clinton and the secretive denizens of the deep state. You know that only Donald Trump stands between you and a damned and ravaged world. You see plague and pestilence sweeping the planet and understand that they are part of the plan. You know that a clash between good and evil cannot be avoided and you yearn for the great awakening that is coming. And so you must be on guard at all times. You must shield your ears from the scorn of the ignorant. You must find those who are like you and you must be prepared for, to fight. And you know all of this because you believe in Q. So one of the earliest things we saw with self radicalization online is with Edgar Madison Welch. I don't know if anybody remembers this, but there was um, disinformation going around that Hillary Clinton was running a pedophile ring at the bottom of this pizza joint. <laughs> and so this guy got so outraged and got himself in some echo chambers and some forums and was so convinced that only he would be able to rescue these children that he stormed into this pizza place with a gun and, you know, obviously he found out that there was no pedophile ring running by Hillary Clinton. But it's just a great classic example of what happens when it fits into your worldview, when you already hate Hillary Clinton, if you're already getting into these, you know, chat rooms where you're spreading disinformation about her with Benghazi and all, all, all this other um, misinformation that was going around, that it's very easy for him to believe that, yeah, why wouldn't she have a pedophile ring in the bottom of pizza? Makes total logical sense to me. Right. And, and, you know, another thing we have to note is here is misinformation online leading to real-world consequences, real-world right. violence. So one of the things that's interesting in QAnon is that it actually started with a, a little throw-off comment by President Trump um, in, on the 5th of October in 2017. He essentially is speaking with a large group of people where he says, that this is a calm before the storm. So we want to share the video with you um, that is essentially the beginning of QAnon. Can you guys hear this? Yeah. Can I just share sound? Oh, darn. Did you check here? This is volume. Oh, volume's up. Well. All right, so if you can't see it, basically what Trump is saying is that they are, he's referring to a storm. A storm is coming. It's a calm before the storm. And reporters start asking, well, what do you mean by that? Well, what do you mean by that? And so then what we see is that immediately following this is Q's first drop, right? So Q starts posting in Reddit, and he starts posting on the 28th of October, so after this. And so people who believe in Q believe in it because it is so easy to read into the different um, clues that he leaves, right? So Q can do ominous predictions. And just like Nostradamus, we can make that fit into I was just going to say that. Like, when you go get your towel red and I leave it so vague, like, right. you will meet someone. <laughs> like, okay. <laughs> that they read my future. Right. Who knew? Um, there's also the cryptic riddles, right? right? So there's the find the reflection inside the castle. That sounds like a fun scavenger hunt, you know? Um, one of the things they truly believe is that the deep state or Democrats traffic children, right? And only Trump can stop them. Q claims to be highly ranked within the intelligence community. And essentially, as long as I'm a follower of him, I can interpret what he says at any time. Now I use he, but I actually don't have I any idea what gender we are talking about. Q drops keep people searching. So just like any addiction, once Q drops a certain piece of information, people start searching. They start tearing apart the internet, videos, and all sorts of things in order to find the true meaning of what Q is telling them. And essentially, to know the truth, you have to believe in Q. Right. So they refer to Donald Trump as Q+. Okay. 
And, and it's interesting because when you follow him, any kind of gesture he makes, any kind of tie color he, may, he wears, any like facial expression, he's sending them messages, secret messages that only they can interpret and act on, right? So in this quote we have, he is telling us there's no virus threat because it's the exact same color as the, his tie, is the exact same color as the maritime flag that represents the vessel that had no infected people on it. So because he wore, it was a, it was a yellow tie, right? <laughs> because he wore this yellow tie, he's telling the people that there's no such thing as the virus because his tie matches the certain flag on this vessel where no one got infected. Mm -hmm. Now, I didn't include this in the slides, but there was actually this stuff about uh, Fauci and how they would dissect Fauci's um, presentations to the public about the, the virus. And they would say that because of certain ways he's moving his hands, there's different hand signals. So basically anything can be torn apart in a conspiracy theory. So the FBI assesses these conspiracy theories that they will emerge, they will spread and evoke a modern inform information marketplace, occasionally driving both groups and individual extremists to carry out criminal or violent acts. So the, the FBI is concerned about Q and their conspiracies. So people don't wake up one day and say, I want to self-radicalize myself and go shoot up a mosque or a school or anything like that. It starts off because, you know, you, you kind of have these certain ideas in your head and then basically you stumble upon like a Reddit thread or a YouTube channel or maybe a Facebook post and it gets your curiosity going, right? Mm -hmm. And so... These alt-right people, or even Antifa, they're not dumb. They understand the power and the use of social media. And so that's why they use it as a major tool. So your recruitment's target first contact with violent extremist ideology. And then the target evaluates the ide ideology for credibility and relevance. And again, we're going back to the echo chamber. So they're gonna start doing their own research, but mm -hmm. they're not looking at unbiased resources, right? They're going to go to resources that actually just kind of, uh, What's the word I want? Like, just coincide, like, just reinforce. Re reinforce their beliefs. Thank you. And then identification, right? So now you identify as an inherent. You're like, yes. And then we have that tribal mm -hmm. mentality, right? I identify with these people. I have found my folks. This is where I'm going to reside. And then the target also for self critique asks whether or not they're doing enough for the cause. Am I doing enough to stop with the Jewish question? Or am I doing enough? to make sure we're you know, getting enough like white babies born in the world. Mm -hmm. I mean, these ideas that I'm saying sound really weird to you, but I'm gonna tell you as we go on in this presentation, these are just a skim, they're, they're actually like not as crazy as some of the ideas we came upon. Right. And then finally, you have the decision to act. And I also wanna just mention that like, a lot of times too, we have what's called lone wolf terrorism, which we'll talk a little bit more. And that's just the one individual, it just takes one individual to have these steps, curiosity, consideration, identification, mm -hmm. self-critique, and then finally the decision to act to wreak havoc on society. Mm -hmm. So again, just some behavioral indicators of self-radicalization. So again, searching behavior is indicative of the cognitive opening. So I'm doing searching like, you know what, um, uh, I feel that we should not let any more Hispanic people in the country. I'm going to start doing research mm -hmm. on it and the reasons why we shouldn't let that expression of disillusionment, why I think, you know, they're taking our jobs, you know, that sort of thing. And so now I'm going to start seeking alternate information venues that actually just reinforce my belief systems. And right. Then you have detachment. So now they're, take, they're kind of moving away from their peers, their family, and they're going more and more down the rabbit hole online and aligning with people who think just like them, perhaps even meeting up with some of them at local spots, right, or maybe a rally, um, then begins to proselytize, right? Now they're preaching to the choir, they're spreading the message, and now they also are picking fight with other community members. So in a, another presentation we do, we talk about trolls, right? Mm -hmm. So this is some kind of a view of trollism where you could post like, well, you know, they're hardworking people coming from Mexico, you know, they're taking the lowest of the low jobs, this and that, but now you're gonna start picking fights. Then you have peer immersions. Well, some of them are actually leading home to be closer to their peers that share the same ideas. Um, seeking new ways to demonstrate commitment to the new ideological commitment. Maybe it's by attending a rally, creating a rally, starting social media threads with disinformation. And then finally, the ultimate and the worst step is planning an execution of violence. 
So you're attempting or enacting violent action, issuing threats online in real life, um, and starting to take practical steps to um, carry out attacks. And so we wanted to say that this isn't a modern event, right? This isn't a modern thing. Mm -mm. We're going to go all the way back to 1903 to talk about, and we could probably go, go much, much further, much further. Much further, but for the sake of brevity, kind of time. <laughs> <laughs> for the sake of brevity, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about just the last century or so um, and talk about two major things that have radicalized and continue to radicalize people to this day. So we're going to start with the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. So this is a Russian serial that was published in 1903 in a, essentially a magazine. And what you'll under, come to understand is that as you look at modern radicals, they're often, often quoting the ideas that came about in the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. So it's essentially a work of fiction. It's intentionally written to blame Jews for a variety of ills. Those who distribute it claim that it documents a Jewish global conspiracy to control the world, and essentially their leaders, the elders of Zion, never actually existed. But why it works is that it's written in such a way to get people to actually believe it. It is written like the minutes from a meeting within Jewish leaders where they describe their secret plans. So this book was published as an expose, a see what is happening behind the, the lines, right? What's happening under the surface that you need to be aware about. Then we have people like in the US, Henry Ford actually distributed this tract through his newspaper, the Dearborn Independent. So he basically shares this ideology and spreads it within the United States. He also published The International Jew, and it was a book that included this series and was translated into at least 16 languages. So now we're gonna talk about the Turner Diaries. So the Turner Diaries are, or is known as one of the best, or the best known racist novels written in English basically since the fall of Nazi Germany. So the Turner Diaries, if you're not familiar with them, is a post-apocalyptic diatribe about a group of right-wing pro-grun extremists who want the world to be rid of um, pr pretty much anybody of color who is non-white. This is a tract that calls for bombings. Um, in fact, in the Turner Diaries, there is a very explicit description of how to build bombs using fertilizer and things like this, which we will call back in just a second. At the end of the Turner Diaries, Turner, the main character, um, dives his plane into the Pentagon, essentially ending what we know as democracy in America, bringing about the space for a right-wing, totalitarian, free white society. So here is a quote from the Turner Diaries, which was published in 1978. If the white nations of the world had not allowed themselves to become subject to the Jew, the Jewish ideas to the Jewish spirit, this war would not be necessary. We can hardly consider ourselves blameless. We can hardly say that we had no choice, no choice to avoid the Jews' snare. We can hardly say that we were not warned. And so this is what we start to see, this, this discussion of we have to take action, right? That we need to take a stand or we're going to lose everything that we identify with as who we are. This basically, the, the Turner Diaries, oh, this was it's yours. Okay. <laughs> Flower. I'm it. just going to take it. I know. We just, <laughs> so I want to just say this is just literally four hate groups. When we were doing our research, we could just do a whole hour to two or three on just all the subgroups of hate groups that actually have splintered off some of the main ones. So we have the order. Um, they are looking at assassination, murder and robbery. We have another one called the Aryan Republic Army. Again, robbery, Elm City, explosives. You have the National Socialist Underground and Sons of Odin. And what they all have in common is that they're using use of social media. So I just have some notes I just wanted to talk about. So for example, the soldier, soldiers of, um, it's actually the soldiers of Odin, 
they started out as a small Facebook group. This group actually comes out of Europe in response to the migration that was going on um, during the last couple years. And so it actually took off in the United States from a handful of followers within maybe six months to over a group of 4,000. Um, and it's interesting because within these groups, and that's one thing I was talking to Emily about, is when you research these groups, they come, they're not, they actually come from different backgrounds. And what ends up happening is these groups start infighting and ultimately break up, which for us is kind of good news. <laughs> but just to give you an idea for the subgroups that are within a lot of these um, hate groups, you have white supremacists, which includes Klansmen, racist skinheads, neo-Confederates, neo-Nazis. And then for like the Sons of Odin, you have Norse paganism, um, which uh, itself, Astaratu, is not white supremacist intrinsically, but it's drawing white supremacists to it. Um, you also have anti-Muslim bigots, anti-government extremists. And then you have the percenter movement, which is a growing wing of militia movement that shares its conspiratorial anti-government ideology. So it's interesting to note that they don't all come from the same background, but what unites them is that tribal that we talked mm -hmm. about where you're finding your people that you even know where your background comes from, you still hate mm -hmm. migrants, Jews, blacks, yep. Hispanics, anything that doesn't idolize the white narrative. And you know, just to say that a lot of these have common writings, right? So the Turner Diary acts as sort of a Bible, an inspiration. So the order is named after the order in the Turner Diaries, which was actually the group that ends up th overthrowing the government. So they, they, they gain inspiration also from common sources. And so we're gonna talk about Timothy McVeigh. Um, before 9-11, and actually to this day, Timothy McVeigh is responsible for the largest piece of domestic terrorism in our history. He killed 168 people um, with a truck bomb built very similarly to how it was described in the Turner Diaries. What was different was that McVeigh made it bigger than what was described in the Turner Diaries. So, Timothy McVeigh was a radicalized ex-army person who used to tr travel around to gun shows. And at the gun shows, what he would do was try to share the Turner Diaries and share these things with people. There is actually video of Timothy McVeigh at Waco, Texas, as the siege on the compound at Waco was happening. And McVeigh was sitting there selling buttons and selling tracks of the Turner Diaries and for some of these far-right militia groups. Um, so Timothy McVeigh was a adherent and often shared the ideology that was found in the Turner Diaries and was you know, essentially responsible for, like I said, the biggest incidents of domestic terror in the United States. And I wanna point out that when he was arrested, the Turner Diaries was opened to a page that was highlighted saying that the real value of the attacks lie in its psychological impact. So they want people to see this as an inspiration. And this is what we're gonna kind of talk about is how acts of violence that we find abhorrent and terrifying are often used as inspiration to perpetuate violence. So some of the blogs, newsletters, websites that have become um, very um, influential in the alt-right movement. Uh, one of them is the Daily Stormer. It's a community and message board that uh, is misogynistic and Holocaust denial commentary and advocates for a second genocide of Jewish people. Then we have the Vanguard News Network, which is also an anti-Semitic and white supremacist website and forum described by the Anti-Defamation League as one of the most active white supremacist sites on the internet. And then we have, so you know what's interesting is when I was doing research, I kept learning these new terms. Mm -hmm. One of this was identity Europa, and it's the forefront of the racist alt-right's effort to recruit white college-age men and transform them into a fashionable new face of white nationalism. So rather than degenerating people of color, this campus-based organization focuses on raising white racial consciousness, building community based on shared racial identity and intellectual and white supremacist ideology. And we just want to mention that flyers for Identity Europa were found on UMass Amherst campus, as well as other campuses in the state of Massachusetts. So 
when we're talking about white nationalist channels, what we're really talking about is different channels that have become an easy place for white supremacists to share their ideology, to spread their ideology. Because what happens is these forums are known as the last bastions of free speech, right? These are places people can go and say whatever they want without the fear of censorship. And so these should be familiar to you. We've got Gab, Discord. I always want to say Parlay, but as my husband always tells me, they're not French. I guess it's Parlor. <laughs> <laughs> the 4 or 8chan or 8coon and Telegram. Right. All of these things are, are channels, right? Like uh, networks right. that they use. I just want to say, I drove down a couple of uh, rabbit holes with 4chan, and it was very misogynistic. And I, don't, I mean, honestly, it was basically that white women deserve to be raped. Why should we have to pay for anything or do it? I mean, it was, I was, as I was reading it, like it was just quite horrifying. But because it's not like Facebook, it's not like Twitter, it's not like Instagram, there's nothing really monitoring what they're saying. So they feel free to be like their true authentic selves, mm -hmm. however disgusting it may be. And so it's kind of uh, interesting to go down some of these rabbit holes. Yeah, I mean, I do believe 8chan has now been disbanded. Yes. So they did shut that down. Yep. But again, it's like it's like a Hydra monster, right? It's like you cut off one head, three more pop up in its place. Right. And, and so the, the community looks for places to spread their ideology. So one of the things they do is they utilize the YouTube algorithm. They use encrypted chat apps like Telegram and Discord so that they can stay anonymous. They take advantage of misogyny in things like Gamergate, where there was a huge backlash against female gamers, where you know the, the far right used this to propagate misogyny and violence against women. Can I just women. mention that my daughter is a female streamer, mm -hmm. right? And she's quite got a quite a large following, and she actually was targeted, and it was horrible. It was absolutely horrible. So she had to go to great lengths to keep her real identity Right, so a lot of gamers use fake names. You know, she, she went to great lengths to kind of hide who she really was and all that other stuff. But it is real, and I saw my daughter being a target of it. Yeah. It's it's scary, right? Yeah. So internet, the internet boards are things that they would use as well. So we wanted to take a second and talk about how YouTube really works. And YouTube has come um, under some fire lately essentially because what they do is what all social media networks do is they want you to stay on their site and what that means is that the more extreme what you're watching the more likely it is you're going to stay and watch it so this is what experts have called the radicalization spiral of the youtube um, algorithm and as Susan was joking earlier, I'm very afraid of what YouTube will now suggest for me after we've done all the research for this the particular algorithm. We'll talk year. about the algorithms, Ooh. yeah. Um, but essentially, you know, it, it creates this platform where if you have something that's minorly racist or minorly misogynistic, it puts you back into this, um, sorry, there's a phone ringing. I was not <laughs> expecting that. Um, it, it allows you to kind of continue down that rabbit hole where you're kind of saying like, oh, this person's interested in misogyny or interested in um, racism or using racist terms, then it keeps feeding that information back in. It allows for recru recruitment, right, through videos that are propagated by specific um, groups, and it essentially can promote radical white supremacy. So algorithms are essentially used so that people get for... Can, we, can you just go back one yeah. point? Because I just wanted to make a point before I get interrupted. So Gavin McInnes, who mm -hmm. is the founder of the Proud Boys, when his YouTube channel has probably the most hits of any kind of alt-white supremacy, and it was through these YouTube channels that he gets the biggest followers. So I just want to show that it's no joke. Mm -mm. Right, so sorry. No, you're fine. Yeah, so the algorithms, right. So algorithms are in everyday life. So for example, if you mention, I want to go maybe get a flannel shirt from L.L. Bean, look at your Facebook, look at your Instagram, now you're just getting tons of L.L. Bean things. Or once you click on anything, you're going to start getting that suggestion. Social media sites, as she had said earlier, they want you to stay. They don't want you to get off their sites. And so they're going to keep feeding you things that you like. 
And what happens is, inadvertently what happens is you get into, again, I use the term echo chamber. So for example, I think it was Yale, was it Yale that did this? Or Harvard, I can't remember what college they did it, but they created two profiles. Yep. One profile was clearly just um, liberal so democratic, and so that's all that they clicked. And so anything like, say, for gun control, that's all Facebook or Instagram would feed them, the stuff that fit into their ideology. Mm -hmm. Versus they set up another account that was actually very um, uber conservative. And again, so that's the way Facebook and social media works, is that they're going to feed you what you want to hear and see. Right. And I, I just want to point out that the Facebook whistleblower that was testifying before Congress just a few months ago was talking about how after the election, Facebook turned off its protections against misinformation and things like this. So while we thought that some of these companies were making an effort to stop it, we are actually seeing more and more and more people, you know, that, that it works for Facebook. Right. So that's why they keep it. Oops, wrong thing. So now we want to talk about some, um, a particular network that was set up in order to um, spur kind of hate speech. And that is the Right Stuff Network, home of the podcast, The Daily Showa. Right. So the, the, um, the Right Stuff and The Daily Showa, I believe as we looked at statistics, they're the number two disinformation sites that people get self-radicalized on. So the Right Stuff is the brainchild of Mike Enoch, it started as a political, political blog in 2012, and it's actually one of the largest alt-right media platforms. And together, the two sites, again, propaganda machines, they're also some of the most effective spaces for organizing real-world local groups. They either called book clubs, sounds pretty benign, and by the stormer in pool parties on the right stuff. So the Southern Poverty Law Center realized that on one of the message boards, it was, I think it was one of, it was Reddit or one of the Chans, that the, the, the white supremacist community had posted their own poll. And the, they had asked their, themselves, what brought you into the fold? What brought you into the white supremacist fold? And so what we have in the next few slides is the people that were most commented on as bringing them into the white supremacist movement. So we've got Milo, Milo Yiannopoulos, who 12% of users said was part of their alt-right transformation. So he was somebody who was flamboyant. He would go to college campuses mm -hmm. in order to kind of like stoke a little bit of you know, unrest and um, just some real divisive speech. Became like what we would say like a social media influencer, right? He I had the that. fashion, he had the cool hair Glasses. Right, right. <laughs> Um, then you have something called Red Ice, and Red Ice was essentially something that started out very similar to um, Alex Jones and Infowars, right? It, it talked about the paranormal, stopped, talked about conspiracy theories, and then it essentially became a white nationalist platform that is quoted by white supremacists themselves as one of the reasons they were uh, radicalized. We have um, Andrew Auernheimer, who is a neo-Nazi white supremacist. He's famous for his internet trolling and extremely violent rhetoric advocating genocide of non-whites. He was listed as extremely influential. Oh, someone needs oh, to someone, mute. Somebody needs to mute. Um, uh, can you deposit that check into your account? The, the taxes? Laura, Laura, you're not muted. You're not muted. <laughs> <laughs> so Laura's our co our, co our colleague, colleague. So and she'll also be presenting in the spring on yes. this information uh, in health sciences. And, so and make sure to catch that. Payback is a dish best served. <laughs> Revenge is a dish best served. <laughs> right. Payback. All right. So you have these these influencers, right? These people who are part right. of the, right. the machine. Right. So Gavin McInnes, again, she I mentioned him before. Murray. He's the proud boy. He actually said that his club wasn't anything to do with uh, anti-racism or white propaganda, but actually was a drinking club in the same vein of an Elks Lodge, <laughs> right? And he's taken pain to distance himself from the alt-right, but um, he's actually more what we would call like a Western chauvinistic. Mm -hmm. And so I found it interesting, just recently at a rally, he was trying to find wives for his Proud Boys. And like, don't you want to stay home and cook and clean and bear children? No. So, hey, I mean, you know. 
<laughs> Let's see how that goes for them. Right, exactly. Right. So Susan already talked about Mike Penovich. He founded the right stuff. And then you have someone like Jared Taylor, who is actually appealing because he brings a pseudo-academic, you know, style to what he writes. Right. Um, he regularly publishes um, pro-eugenic and anti-black, anti-Latino racist diatribes. The last list of people is, you know, just again, people who are in the white supremacist movement has, have quoted as people who have inspired them. So Jim Goad wrote the Redneck Manifesto, and he is um, definitely somebody who has influenced a lot of people to join the movement. Then you have Stefan Molyneux, and he is an Irish-born Canadian far-right white nationalist um, who essentially is, like you said, I think influencer was the best term. Right. I hadn't even thought to apply right. that. But he basically goes out there and uses all of these social media platforms to spread conspiracy theories, scientific racism, eugenics, and different views. And then we have William L Luther Pierce, who was the author of the Turner Diaries. So what we want to just say is what, what white supremacists refer to as red pilling, like I have taken the red pill, goes back to the matrix, mm -hmm. right? You now know the truth. So individuals who have taken the red pill see themselves as being part of the people who know the real truth, what is really going on in the world. Um, so that is something that, that's a term that you will see off and on. And then a familiar um, term, the JQ, which is something that the white supremacists have used to kind of modernize the very old Jewish question. I have a um, screenshot, well, not screenshot, but I have some quotes here from people who were talking, right? So you have one user say, I have a feeling that the noses are going to the sh to show up for this program. The mighty hammer of Odin is the perfect tool for smashing noses. And we see a lot of racist vitriol in just that one line. Um, we see the mighty ha hammer of Odin, so that goes back to this idea of Norse mythology. Right. And the three parentheses around noses is actually a meme called echoes, which the, the far right uses to indicate Jewish, a Jewish person, or institution, or something like that. It's like, so when they're trying to be severely anti-Semitic, they use these quotation mark or the, the parentheses as part of it. Um, you know, once you are woke on the JQ, there's no going back. You can't untake that red pill. And this just goes on and on, this type of anti-Semitic language. And they also have, like, again, using, like, the things with the noses, the red pill. They also have a term called 1488. Mm -hmm. um, 1488 is a combination of um, the first syllabus 14, which is a slogan is, we must secure the existence of our people in a future for white children. And the second is 88, which stands for Heil Hitler. So it actually is just a general endorsement for white supremacy. So they have all these hidden clues that only if you're within the movement that you totally understand and get it. So if I, if I get a text when someone's being passive aggressive and they end it with an LOL, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like you know you're not being funny, you're kind of being mean, but mm -hmm. it's kind of like the same ideology. And so they're using it by using memes. So by taking pictures and putting anti-racist slogans on it and making it kind of funny, they're kind of trying to soften their message, but what they're doing is they're drawing in people, like particularly young people. Yep. It appeals to them, right? It, it's their sense of humor anyway, just mixed with racist yeah. ideology. So this is an example of Pepe the Frog, um, which has been essentially de like um, taken over by he the was far a, right. Yeah, he was a very benign caricature that this artist had created that now this artist has basically killed him off because he was horrified right. that his 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 art had been taken into the wrong direction. Right, and so here you can see it. I keep thinking this is Idi Amin, but it's not. I think it's Pinochet. So um, you can see on the left, you've got Vlad the Imperiler and Pinochet, you know, two very cruel, despotic leaders who are put together at, or like held up by the right as, you know, marks of people who we should respect. Then you have the image on the right which is, it looks as if mid-massacre, Pepe is reloading his weapon. This is a white genocide meme that was taken um, from the internet, and basically, so this is the kind of thing that you would see as a, as a meme that people on the far right would share. 
So what we saw was there has been a fracture of the alt-right movement. And unfortunately, that has led to a far more violent um, reality. So in 2018, the Unite the Right rally um, happened. Heather Heyer was killed. Or no, wait, that was Charlottesville. I'm getting my far right um, it's not <laughs> things right. mixed up. Um, where essentially the, uh, the Proud Boys and a bunch of people marched saying, you know, things like the Jews will not replace us. And this was seen as a fracturing moment. So people, there was a lot of backlash and the far right started to kind of break apart. Groups that were seen as kind of the vanguard, the ones that were really being innovative, started to kind of like fall back. And what we saw was the rise. Right, well, yeah. So Louis Beam is historically an alt-right Ku Klux Klan member that has gone back um, from the beginning with inciting um, violence. It was in 1992, however, that he started what he called the leaderless resistance. It's also known as lone wolf terrorism. So basically, when Ku Klux Klan, especially in the late 60s and the 70s, they were easily infiltrated. I highly recommend to read the book, The Black Klansman. It's also a movie, but it was like basically where a black police officer from Colorado infiltrated Ku Klux Klan, right? And um, Louis Beam said, hey, you know what? Because you guys are so big and you're so out there, it's easy for the FBI, CIA, and local police authorities to target you. Mm -hmm. So what you need is to do it on your own. Because if they don't know what you're doing, you're going to have a better, higher rate of actually pulling off the violence than being in a large group. Um, it said, uh, he said he called on white revolutionaries to abandon planning in large groups and instead take action in small cells of one to six men. The basic idea was to avoid the destruction of revolutionary organizations when they were infiltrated or in other ways compromised by law enforcement, limiting damage to a single cell at once. Mm -hmm. So by utilizing the leaderless resistance concept, all individuals and groups operate independently of each other. They never report to a central headquarters or a single leader. Mm -hmm. And so with this ideology, we actually start seeing more lone wolf terrorism in the United States. When we were told, again, disinformation, that we were more likely to be attacked by Muslims that was erroneous. Most of the attacks that have happened on the soil have happened by white US citizens, particularly male. So our first example of the leaderless resistance happens to be Anders Bern Brevik. So in 2011, Brevik entered, or he set up a, a truck bomb in Oslo, and then he quickly took his car, caught a boat in a police uniform to the island of Utoya, where he proceeded to kill roughly 77 teenagers that were part of the Labor Party movement. I believe him, he was on that island for about three hours. Yeah, it, was, it was definitely, it was a long time. He, he, he had free range and just shot up everyone mm -hmm. and everything. And so Brevik is what the white supremacist community calls a saint. So a saint is somebody who has committed mass violence, mass murder, and is held up by the far right as an example of a really good person, right? Somebody we should idolize, somebody we should follow. Brevik is, you know, not the first lone wolf terrorist, but when we're talking about far right ideology as we see it today, he is kind of was the first one who really started spurring this idea of we can go out and we can make this damage by ourselves. Right. So this manifesto, how, how many pages was it? 1,285 1, pages? Sure. We, we like <laughs> read it. And it is a <laughs> hand guide on how to sow discord and become a lone wolf terrorism. Build bombs. He, build bombs. Oh, if you can't get fertilizer, I'm going to show you how to grow beets to make your own fertilizer mm -hmm. to make your own bombs. It's also a diatribe against um, higher education, particularly he did not like sociologist professors. <laughs> Think of you, Colleen. Um, Watch out. Right? Uh, he also did not like women. I mean, it was just this, this diatribe. And again, towards the end, very detailed, like how what kind of weapons you should use and what kind of situation, what kind of clothing you should wear, what kind of shoes you should wear. It's extremely detailed. And now it's become a Bible of sorts to the people who want to follow these footsteps. Absolutely. And what we'll kind of start to talk about is how manifestos are used to continue the radicalization of others. So a very new thing in the far right movement 
is founded in something called the Dark Enlightenment. Mm -hmm. Nick Land in the 1990s started to write about neo-reaction. And essentially, this is the idea that capitalism should be accelerated to the point where only corporate powers rule and they rule exclusively, allowing the natural hierarchies of our society to emerge. Um, the idea, they believe in something called human biodiversity, where we know that DNA makes us all practically similar. They don't believe that that is true. Right. They reject democracy, um, and they reject egalitarianism. Right. This is essentially a rejection, a rejection of enlightenment right. ideals. And I just have a note here that near, um, that near reactionaries believe that while technology and capitalism have advanced humanity over the past couple centuries, Democracy has actually done more harm than good, and they propose a return to old-fashioned gender roles, social order, and monarchy. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the good times. And this is what is called as accelerationism. So we have accelerationism, a definition in just a second, but accelerationists are the people who go out there, and what they want to do is so, so discord. Right? Chaos. They reject the outright. They think the Proud Boys are weak. Mm -hmm. They do not think those kinds of organizations are going to get the job done. Their whole purpose is to use violence against minorities in order to encourage the destruction of our civilization. And what's interesting about acceleration is that it's both sides. So they basically mm -hmm. want you to vote for the most extreme candidate. It doesn't even have to be Republican. For example, they were endorsing Bernie Sanders because He's basically, busy. right, where did I stop? Um, one poster even heralded the rise of Bernie Sanders on the grounds that his proposed ex expansions of the welfare state would bankrupt the U.S. government and thus undermine its grip on power. And that would give them the end to return us back to a monarchical right. government. Right. And Susan and I have done a little bit of research on what Russia's intentions are at destroying our democracy. The, the accelerationists share those ideas. They want democracy to fail, they want it to crumble, they want it to break. So here is a quote by Christopher Wray, who I believe is still our FBI director? Yes, okay, sorry. <laughs> a majority of the domestic terrorism cases that were investigated, are, that we've investigated, are motivated by some version of what you might call white supremacist violence. And this goes back to this idea that we have forgotten about Timothy McVeigh and we've forgotten about the Murrah Federal Building and what happened there in 1995 because it was eclipsed by this huge terrorist attack in 9-11. But when it comes to homegrown terror, Timothy yeah. McVeigh and the 168 killed in Oklahoma yeah. was by far the biggest white supremacist attack in the United and States. And Christchurch shooter was also was mm -hmm. an accelerationist. Yep. Right? So it has far-reaching tentacles. And again, this was a word as I did research, like I had not heard of this before. Right. So it's just something that, again, my vocabulary just keeps growing the more oh, yeah. we do the work. Absolutely. So we are going to highlight one, or we're going to highlight two groups. So these are two accelerationist groups um, that could be called militant terrorists. You have Adam Waffen Division, which literally means in German, um, I think it's the atomic or the nuclear bomb division. And essentially what they've done is they've formed a network of terrorist cells. So they work very similarly to what we would, you know, kind of connect with jihadist terrorism. Um, they work towards the, the collapse of civilization. Their belief system is violence, right? They believe that violence will bring about a new social white order. And then we have the base, which is actually, I, I didn't know this, Al-Qaeda means the base. So this is a total white supremacist group also called the base. The international, it's an international group. So there are cells of the base in Canada, in the United States, in Australia. And the goal, again, is to encourage the collapse of society. And one of the ways they do this is the manifesto. So we just showed you one, that 1,200 page. You have a couple others. It's, so it's basically a diatribe of how much they hate everyone, how much they hate the world, how you can blow stuff up, basically create chaos, so discord. Um, and, and the scary part is they're very easy to find. Mm -hmm. If you know what you're looking for. So we were kind of shocked as we plowed through, I think we read, I don't know, like over 20, yeah, two was, dozen manifestos. It was depressing. <laughs> it was, 
But it, what was really scary is just how easy they, they are to find. And who knows? Maybe this lecture is maybe self radicalizing people. Oh, who, who knows? I don't know. All right. So we are going to just kind of highlight a few accelerationists. One was Robert Bowers, who essentially walked into the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh um, and shot 11 people and injured seven. So killed 11 people and injured seven. He was considered an accelerationist, hoping that this would spur more violence on the Jewish community. As Susan mentioned earlier, we have Brenton, Brenton Tarrant. Tarrant. And Church. he was absolute, absolutely an accelerationist. And he killed 51 people on, during Friday prayer at the Al Noor Mosque in Christchurch, New Zealand. And we actually have, for your reading pleasure, some highlights. And we, we're running out of time, so we're yeah. just going to let you just look at that. Um, but yeah, so again, this is the Great Replacement. This is actually also used by other people as kind of their Bible. Right. So we have white genocide, fascism, accelerationism. We have John Ernest, who killed one at a, a synagogue in California. And then we have his manifesto, where you can see he actually quotes Breton Tarrant. He refers to Breton Tarrant as an inspiration for his own attacks. So these people feed on each other. They feed on violence, and they feed on themselves. And that brings us to where we are today. Um, so as we look into the future, what are the things that we can expect? Um, so one of the things that we need to kind of understand is how the far right is using our existing institutions in order to radicalize and train each other. So the base, for instance, encourages people to join the National Guard or the Army Reserves in order to get the, the training, the militant training, that they can then take back to the white supremacist organization and train each other. And this has historical. I know, I was like such a nice. So it has historical <laughs> precedent because the fall of Rome happened because one of the Gothic kings, Alaric, he actually was a Roman soldier. So by becoming a Roman soldier, he took back the tactics to his people, and they were, easy, they were easily ready to fight the Romans because he had that tactical knowledge, right? It's like playing for a football team, like, you know, you had Tom Brady playing for the Patriots and going to another team, and you're taking all that knowledge on how mm -hmm. that team plays, how that individual player can play. Absolutely. And so they're, they're using that to their advantage. And on Friday, Kyle Rittenhouse was found innocent of all charges of <sighs> killing two people um, in, oh gosh, what state was that? I'm forgetting. Kenosha, Kenosha Wisconsin, yeah, thank you. right? So in Wisconsin, Kyle attended armed. He crossed state lines, attended a rally, and shot two people who were protesting the um, unarmed killing of a black man. Immediately after this, we saw this kind of commentary in far-right far message boards. They say, we have got to permission to defend ourselves now. We don't need fucking permission, and we never did, because now it's legal precedent. We can protect our communities by referencing Rittenhouse v. Wisconsin. So basically, we're talking about St. Kyle as being called on the far right already. This is particularly emphatic example of the growing unification under extreme anti-government accelerationist goals that is occurring among the American right wing. And we're going to start seeing people use Kyle Rittenhouse as an example to show up armed at protests. This is Alex Newhouse. He is, an, uh, he is a scholar on right wing extremism. And he says the far right will feed on his example, build on his example, use it as a blank check to go do more radicalization and mobilization. It gives the extreme violent neo-Nazi crowd a new excuse to make more and stronger connections to less extreme crowds. And then just this morning, we took a second to look at what the far right was saying about the person who ran into a crowd at a Christmas parade. And um, on the left, we see a post in Gab where Augustus basically says, black guy running over a bunch of white children in a Christmas parade with an SUV, remove them all from this country, enough is enough. And just because we talked about misinformation, misinformation is already being spread about this attack. So it happens almost immediately. And we've talked about in other presentations that as soon as something happens, that uh, already they're already on the internet using social media to influence what people see and think. Mm -hmm. 
So we wanted to leave you with this quote. This is the face of radical, the radical right today. It will continue to persist so long as we, scholars, authorities, and practitioners, continue to misunderstand lone, lone, that was a typo, sorry everybody, lone wolf terrorism and discount the dangers of siege culture coming from either keyboard warriors or misguided youth. So now that we've brought you down our deep dark rabbit hole, <laughs> we're wondering if anybody has any questions. Hi, this is uh, Gabe Pereira. I'm up there as owner because I have a new, new laptop. Um, what, do you, what is the strategy uh, by the FBI or Department of Justice uh, educators to do something about this problem? So because misinformation is spread pretty much predominantly on social media, there's actually, we're visiting a um, law called Section 230. It actually, basically, Section 230 protects social media from hate speech, right? So under Biden, we're gonna try to change that. There's actually movements going on right now um, to kind of not give immunity to social media sites and to hold them responsible for any kind of the hate speech that's going on right now. As far as educators and like what Emily and I have been doing, it's just to educate. So we go into classrooms and we teach to students and faculty and staff how to fact check, how to do something called lateral reading, mm -hmm. how to make sure you're not in an echo chamber, that you're you're curating your own feed that so you're not just reading CNN or MSBCN. Maybe you're reading other news sites to kind of get more of a well-rounded information. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you have anything to add to that. So one of the things that um, I think the FBI will do as strategy is continue to infiltrate these groups. Mm -hmm. um, they infiltrated the base and arrested a large number of them. Um, there was a small cell in Georgia that was planning to murder a... Um, a, a, an alleged Antifa couple, and they were found out and arrested before anything like that could happen. So I assume the FBI is going to continue with strategies that are sim similar to that infiltration, taking them down from the inside. Um, there is a great podcast out there right now that is all about the base, and it's called uh, White Hot Hate. It's from the Canadian broadcast, um, CBC. There's a question from Will Duffy. Okay. I don't know if you guys can see it or not. I so. Has anything proven effective uh, in stopping someone from progressing on the radicalization spiral in large numbers? Um, if it's on, do you mean, if you're, if you're talking about YouTube, YouTube has been challenged to change their algorithm. But I think that it's still not doing what we would like to see. It's still suggesting further and further more extreme videos as you okay. go. If you mean the continuum, I would actually be very interested in looking that up, Will. I don't know the answer off the top of my head, but I would assume that there are some strategies where people could intervene, which is why we shared the behavioral right. indicators, right? So if you see somebody self-radicalizing, these are the behaviors that they're right. going to display and that they're going to kind of right. have, and I, I'm sure that there's some way well, to Well, honestly, at the end of the day, if you believe what you believe, and even if they shut down the YouTube channel, like again, it's the great headed hydra. Like it doesn't matter. There's really no way, unless you go into some kind of self deprogramming program, like <laughs> they do with people who are put in these cults. Because that's basically essentially how you can view it, is you get involved in these cult like cults. behaviors. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, either the, the extreme would be to get somebody out, deprogram them, but the reality is, there really is no way to stop this. I wish I could tell you guys and wave a magic wand and we can stop all this hate, we can stop all this mm -hmm. disinformation, stop all the misogyny, the hate of Jews, blacks, whatever, but the reality is this goes back a millennia and I just don't actually, I'm sorry, I'm depressing you, but. Yeah, well, yeah. you know, and I was driving here this morning thinking about like our own um, diversity, equity, inclusion mm -hmm. movements. These are the very things that we do as academics, as people who want a fair society that is radicalizing people, right? and, then, and then what happens with that is we have that whole thing with the movement where, with higher ed, where they don't want us teaching. What is the word? I'm uh, critical race theory. Right, so that's the thing. Like as much as we try to enlighten in higher ed, and then we're always gonna have that pushback. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I have a question. Um, so you're talking about uh, people wanting to join the military as a way to become more knowledgeable about working against government. And I was wondering if you read anything about anything that the armed forces or even local well, police, so places like that are trying to do to, you know, disincentivize those kind of people from joining 
Sure. So, so I don't know any off the top of my head, but that podcast does talk about a Canadian um, Army reservist who the Canadian, the Canadian Army did no background checks on him, did nothing, and then in some light research that just lateral reading for this presentation, there is information out there about trying to stop militant white supremacists from joining the armed forces. But, you know, with lack of a background check and like scrutinizing their social media, it's difficult. But yes, I think that there should be a, a system set up and I will be happy to check to see what's out there in stopping these, these attacks mm -hmm. and this, this people from getting that training yeah. in the military. You know, and just leave you with this quote, misinformation is a big part of our current polarization because it's hard to bring the country together when each side has its own facts and attributions of responsibility. It helps that some leading social media platforms have limited or banned like, Trump's posting privileges or they shut down like, you know, some of the other, um, what was it like Bannon, like they shut yep. down some of his stuff. But it will not stop the spread of misinformation, right? Because his followers will just share falsehoods on their own sites, and misinformation will continue to divide Americans and poison our political environment. Yes, go ahead. I think we have to be careful about when we say that each side, because I agree. Then, then, it, then it appears like, well, there's no reality here. Right? There's no right. valid. Fact is, we have to look at the context. What are people saying? Right. You know, there is a, there, one side has more truth value than the We other agree. Side, you know? Well, and one of the things that we've found is that when, when we have talked about violent white extremism on the right, we have been challenged with, well, why don't you talk about the violent white extremism on the left, or the, the extremism on the left, and the, the truth is it's just not there to the same numbers, I, to exactly. the same degree, to the same. The only example in all our research, and we dove deep, is Antifa. But when you look at the alt-right, like I said, the groups and the subgroups and the cells, it's, it's mind-boggling. And so I, I know that we try to be fair as, as librarians. We try to make sure that we're presenting facts, that we're using non-biased mm -hmm. resources. But I mean, the truth is out there. Like when I, do, when I do my information literacy classes on misdisinformation, I use memes with mm -hmm. the students. So I print out memes and I have them fact-checked. And I really try to be unbiased, but the, it's so hard to find liberal, democratic, misdisinformation memes. I mean, like, was I able to find a few, like kind of, but they were like partly accurate. It just, that's all I can say. Like I try so hard to kind of like right. say this, but it's well, and reality. There, there are fewer far left manifestos, mm -hmm. far left mass murderers, far, far left Timothy McVeigh's. I mean, the violent white right extremism is the reality that we're facing in the nation today. I mean, we have to, again, we have to look at the issues. If the left, left generally supports women and mm -hmm. men being equal, right? The right doesn't. Right. For example, uh, the, the left tends to, to, to be against racial discrimination. The right yeah. doesn't. So we have to look at each of these issues, despite the, whatever the labels are. What, what are the issues that people stand for? Right. No, that's, I agree. The, I mean, we can talk about tactics, you know, on the left, you know, should the left pursue. You know, during the 60s, late 60s, the weathermen. Right, the weather, yep. Okay, so that was following a certain kind of Ideology, trend. yeah. Even though they may be supporting something positive, the tactics or the strategy was incorrect. Yeah. But we do need to look at the issues. Yeah. And not get caught up in, well, each side has, you know, yeah, it's like climate change. Yeah, exactly. It's like there are no two sides. Right. Mm -hmm. There aren't two. Yeah, the Holocaust did exist. Exactly. Right? There's exactly. no two sides to that. You know? exactly. No. But the, I think right. the thing in closing that is the scariest thing is that when you exist within these communities, you can convince yourself that it's all a conspiracy. You know? Sandy Hook. All a conspiracy. You know, yeah. Holocaust. And I mean, there is no shared reality. Right. right. With that. So on that note, if there's no other questions, we want to thank you for coming to our presentation. Thank you. Um, I wish we could leave you on a happier note, but we all hope you have a wonderful, happy, and safe Thanksgiving. And um, I don't know. Stay woke. Stay woke. <laughs> I love it. All right, bye, guys. Stay woke. Thank you for a nice presentation. Great presentation. Thank you. Thank you.